The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give us your Holy Spirit who writes the preached word into our hearts. May we receive it and believe it, be cheered and comforted by it. Glorify your word in our hearts and make it so bright and warm that we may find pleasure in it. Through your Holy Spirit, think what is right, and by your power, fulfill the word for Jesus, the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. In 1996, rapper Tupac Shakur wrote a song called Only God Can Judge Me. In it, Tupac writes that he's been trapped since birth, cautious because I'm cursed, and goes on to talk about the violence and crime that he grew up witnessing. He talks about what are basically the effects of sin in the world, but in an interlude of the song, he says, I don't see why everybody feel as though they got to tell me how, they, how to live my life. This concept that only God can judge seems to be a near constant theme in our culture today. Phrases like, you do you, and speak your truth, and only God can judge me, are thrown around left and right. We live in a time of pluralism and extreme independence, and to threaten someone's beliefs or positions is seen as an attack on their rights, and in some cases, even an attack on that person as though you punched them in the face. The world seems to think that they know God so well that only he can judge them, assuming that they will come out on the positive end of that interaction. Allow me to introduce you to the God of the universe. We will first look at our passage from Genesis 1 and from in, in Psalm 29. You don't have to turn to Genesis 1, and Psalm's printed for you in the bulletin. I would ask you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4 in your Bibles, as we will be going there in a few minutes. But let us look at just who the God of the universe is, the God that people readily acknowledge is the only one who can judge them. Genesis 1 tells us the story of how God, the God of the universe created all that there is. Three, three key points are established in the creation narrative that apply throughout the entire Bible. First, this narrative establishes that God existed before creation. He existed before, he exists now, and he will exist forever. Second, God was uniquely involved in the origin of the earth and sky. The material and spiritual things of the universe we live in do not exist by themselves, nor are they the result of some impersonal force or other being creating them. The universe exists because God has directly caused it to exist. And third, because the universe and our world are God's creation, they reveal him and are subject to his will. Everything created belongs to God, and he has absolute control over it. Even time, which is the first thing created on day one, as God separated light into darkness into day and night, is subject to God's sovereign, divine, and hidden will. Looking over at Psalm 29, we see the psalmist extolling the power and majesty of, God, of the Lord as it is manifest in creation. The choices the psalmist makes here are significant because all of the nations surrounding Israel worshipped the natural elements and their chief god, Baal, was said to ride the very storms as they raged over the earth. Today, the culture has established science as the ultimate God. We are told to trust the science, and efforts are made to justify all of human behavior through scientific inquiry into other living things. But as the psalmist explains, all the natural elements of the universe are under God's ultimate control. Even science is merely a tool of the creator, a mere explanation and understanding of what God has created in his awesomeness. Psalm 29, verses 1 through 2, begin with a call to worship. The psalmist calls all of heaven and earth to worship God Almighty and to give him credit for his awesome works. The psalmist then goes on to explain just how the voice of the Lord is over the waters. The oceans and seas were seen as untamable sources of chaos by the ancient Israelites. They were mighty, dangerous, unpredictable, and untamable. Yet the psalmist says that the God of glory thunders over the many waters. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 says the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters just before he began creating order from the very chaos of the water. Our God tames chaos with his voice. Psalm 29 goes on in verses 5 and 6 to explain how the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The cedar trees of Lebanon are magnificently beautiful and known for their strength. They can reach 130 feet tall and with a trunk of up to 8 foot 2 inches in diameter. It is exceptionally durable and immune to the ravages of insects. 
It was a beast of a tree. And to the ancient, of Israel, ancient Israelites would have been comparable to the mighty redwood forests of California to us. The psalmist says that just the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. His voice destroys those incredible trees and makes the mountains of Lebanon skip like a calf with earthquakes. The very earth quakes at the voice of God. In verses 7 through 9, the psalmist goes on to tell how the voice of God brings flames of fire and shakes the wilderness. It makes the deer give birth and strips the forest to bear. God's voice brings destruction and life equally and drives those in his temple to cry out, Glory! He concludes the psalm by saying that God sits enthroned over the flood as king forever. He rules over all Israel and the chaotic forces of nature. He rules as king for all eternity. Where other nations saw their earthly king as a god, the Israelites knew that their god was their true king. This is the God of the universe. In his righteousness, he created, the, created and rules over all things. It is God and God alone who determines what is true or not, all, what is good or evil. And he does with create, his creation as he pleases. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, immovable. None can challenge him or dethrone him. I don't know about you, but I would be terrified to have this God judge me. Thankfully, God's characteristics do not stop at his power or his righteousness. As he says to Moses in Exodus, he is the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Indeed, our God is merciful, compassionate, and forgiving, And to that end, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. As we look at our gospel reading for today in Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, we see God's saving work in action. Let us take a closer look. Mark writes that John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. We see here that John the Baptist is preaching and providing a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. The Jews were not unfamiliar with the concept of baptism or purifying an individual by the use of water. We see that repeatedly throughout the law of Moses in Exodus 19 verse 10, Leviticus chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, and 22, and Numbers chapter 8 verse 7 and chapter 19 verse 3. In fact, it was expected by the Jews that the Messiah would undergo some form of baptism when he came at the proper time. But this baptism being preached by John the Baptist was unique, where the purification of individuals by water in the law of Moses was for those who were unclean. This baptism of water by John was for the forgiveness of sins. Under the law of Moses, a sin could only be forgiven by a sacrifice of an animal. Another thing that is interesting is that the Greek text of this passage has the verb ebaptizanto in its passive form. The baptism was not the work of those being baptized, but rather something that was being done to them. We must take the entire expression baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as a whole. This baptism that John was preaching was connected with repentance that resulted in forgiveness from sins. As the person went forward in repentance and had the work of baptism performed for them, their sins were sent away, and every baptism resulted in forgiveness. John's baptism was not law, but gospel, a gift of grace to accept, to receive, not a work to be undertaken. So why do we see in Mark chapter 4, verse 9, that in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan? There are several things to see here. First, John the Baptist is said to have been ministering for about a year, according to tradition. Scripture doesn't give us a time frame, but it would make sense that he had been preaching and baptizing for a while by the time that Jesus arrives to be baptized. Jesus had surely heard of John's work, but waited until the fullness of time to begin his ministry. He didn't just show up when he felt like it, but waited until he knew it was the proper time in keeping with the will of his Father. Second, when we examine the Greek, we see something different in Jesus' baptism from what was described earlier. 
Jesus in no sense accepted John's baptism as obedience to the law, as some might argue, for that would be useless in his case. He didn't need the forgiveness of sin, for he was sinless. Rather, he regarded this baptism as the right way to enter his great office as prophet, high priest, and king. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, chose to put himself by the side of all the sinful ones for whom this sacrament was ordained. In so doing, he connects himself with all of John's baptisms and every baptism that would follow, and signifies that now he is now ready to take upon himself the load of their sins. Jesus assumed this soul as Redeemer and Savior voluntarily. He wasn't called or ordered to go, but rather he came of his own accord. In his baptism, Jesus gave himself to the work of sin-bearing, sanctified the waters for the sacrament that he would later ordain for all after his death and resurrection. And what was the result of his baptism? If you read in verse 10 and 11, And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. God acts here to inaugurate Jesus into his mighty office of high priest, prophet, and king, declaring Jesus to be the God-man and the second person of the Trinity, declaring the sonship of Christ, and and in so doing declares the work that Jesus must do. By the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the voice from the heaven, God the Father accepted Jesus for this work of redemption to pay the price and redeem humanity from our sins. God acted in his compassion and mercy and graciousness by sending his son, Jesus Christ, under the law, born of a woman, 100% God and 100% man, to live the perfect life, to voluntarily submit himself to God as the willing sacrifice for the sins of man, to die in the penalty for that sin and offer his body and blood for our forgiveness. God, the all-power and almighty, the mighty God who created all things, came down from heaven and suffered and died for us so that we might be able to stand in the day of judgment, covered by Christ's perfect life and sacrifice of blood. No matter what our sins or how numerous they may be, we stand in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. So what then? Does this grace mean that we can do whatever we want? That we can sin as much as we want because we're covered by grace? Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, by no means. If you turn there with me as we get ready to close, Paul goes on in verse 2. How can we who, excuse me, how can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now there's a lot to unpack in this passage, and we could easily spend an hour on them. I will do my best to summarize here for you. Through the work of Jesus Christ and through the baptism that he has given us, Luther says that the atom of our flesh was drowned in the waters as we were baptized. Through our baptism, we have died to sin and joined Christ in his death. And just as he is resurrected, now so we too will one day be resurrected into new life. Christ in his death and resurrection has achieved a twofold resurrection for us. We have died to sin and been resurrected to new life spiritually through baptism by the saving work and merit of Jesus Christ. And one day, we will physically die to sin and forever lose the stain and seed of the devil, our sin and flesh. And on that great day of the Lord, we will be resurrected bodily, and our spirit and our body be reunified for eternity, free from the seed of sin forever. Just as Christ did no longer, did no longer feel the outside world after his death and resurrection, so do we withdraw and view ourselves as being dead to the things of this world, even as we are physically present in the world, until the day of our physical death. We have not attained the new life in Christ Jesus fully yet, 
but we walk toward our own death and resurrection by the direction of our own baptism. And we can encounter death with a shout of victory, just as Christ did. Our souls are brought to new life in Christ, even as our flesh remains in the sin of Adam, and the two war against each other. Luther writes that the seed of the devil spoken of in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, is sin itself, and the seed of the woman is the word of God in the church, and that these two seeds are constantly in conflict, as Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. We do fall into sin because we are fallen creatures. Even though our souls have received the wealth of forgiveness and the death to sin through Christ Jesus, our bodies still try to drag us back into sin and the devil constantly tries to lead us astray. And if we do fall into sin, we can take heart for the grace of Christ is as eternal as he is. Even if we sin again and return to Christ in repentance, throwing ourselves on his forgiveness and his saving work performed, we do not die to sin again or need to be baptized again, but rather we continue in the new life of baptism that we have already received. Luther writes that a man who has never been rich can get rich only once, although he can again and again lose and regain his wealth. We who are baptized into Christ should seek and desire to live in a way that reflects that until we are triumphantly freed from the seed of sin in our flesh, either at our own physical death or the return of Jesus Christ. And if we should fail and fall into sin again, take heart, for no sin is so great that you cannot be covered by Christ. When we continue in sin without repentance, we turn our backs on Christ and we lose our wealth of grace. When we repent and throw ourselves on Christ's mercy and grace, remembering our baptism, we regain our wealth. Tupac and so many others continued to live in their lives, declaring that only God can judge me. Humanity continues in that original sin of Eve, declaring for themselves what is good or evil and rejecting God's declaration of what is good or evil. Most assuredly, we will all stand before the Lord our God and face judgment. We will all give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead, as 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5 says. But where the world would say in arrogant defense of their own sin, only God can judge me, we can humbly say that thanks to Christ Jesus, God has judged me to be righteous. We do not have to tremble in fear of destruction and punishment at the thought of meeting our God face to face but rather we can look eagerly and expectantly forward to that glorious day when God will again send his son, our savior, Jesus Christ to earth, this time to render judgment upon the wicked and bring resurrection to those who have died with him in baptism. First Peter 3, 21 says that, the baptism, that baptism now saves you through the resurrection of Christ Jesus. You who are baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death, had your old sinful self crucified with him, and you are no longer enslaved to sin. Rather, you are dead to sin and set free to be alive in God, in Christ, to God in Christ Jesus. You are free. You are dead yet alive. And no matter your sin, whether before or after your baptism, you can and will be forgiven in Christ Jesus. Just throw yourself upon him and his promises and receive his gift. And you will be free. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for the sending your son to die for us. We thank you so much for the might and strength of your creation, and we thank you for seeing us as worthy of your salvation. We thank you for the gifts you've given us in the word and in the sacraments it's through which we learn about you, we have our faith grow, and through whom we are saved. Through you and your, the work of your son, we are saved. And we look forward, Lord, to the day when we shall know, see you face to face when we will stand before you covered in the work of Christ and, hear the, and we will hear those, faithful, those wonderful words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, now I ask that you give us peace of heart and peace of mind as we rest in the promises and work of your son and we receive his sacrament, that you would give us peace and that you give us the urgency and the passion with which to share this truth and this hope with all those we know. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who, to, who with you and the Holy Spirit is worshipped and glorified, one God, forever and ever. Amen.